Regenerative Ed is produced by Grounded Teaching, inspired by joy and being alive and being creative and possibility, even when things seem just hard, like right now when I have a cold. So excuse me if my voice (laughs) sounds a little stuffy. Thank you for trusting me to take a little trip through your ears in this timeless, spaceless internet podcast form. (laughs) Your listening supports the show. And thank you for sharing and subscribing and all the things that you're doing to support us here. We really appreciate it. And I'm getting really excited for May because other than hopefully it finally being done snowing, um, on May 10th, we're doing a workshop called Creating New Beginnings and Redefining Other Endings. And why are we talking about beginnings and endings at this time of year? Well, you know, spring. Spring is where we start to see all the new life popping up, new starts, fresh growth and all of the wisdom that all of that has to offer. So that's the creating the new beginnings part. And then at the same time, we're thinking about redefining other endings. Why are we thinking about that? Well, we're educators and it's May almost. And most of us probably have a countdown to the end of some sort of school year, most of us. And it makes sense to address you know, this tension and um, also the possibility that it holds, right? And to consider what it means for our personal relationships and our relationship with um, work as educators. And we want to just take you through that in this workshop. The workshop is $34. And let me tell you what I think is the coolest part about the workshop. It's actually enveloped by a month of opportunity. So all throughout May, that is going to connect to this very same thing of creating new beginnings and redefining other endings. So starting on May 1st, if you sign up to come to the workshop, you're going to get a workbook that's going to take you through the whole month, week by week, connected to this topic. And the workbook is going to help you think through questions and then give you practices also that you can you know, utilize yourself and ways that you can apply this theme to your classroom. It's also going to prep you for the workshop on May 10th. Then you'll also be invited to join a live Q&A with me where we can use appreciative inquiry to sort of troubleshoot what's going on, put some stuff into practice. And then also, because we don't want everything to be so cerebral all the time, every Tuesday I'm going to share with you some really cool art inspiration that's based on the seasonal theme for um you know, May of creations and endings. And then also, one more thing, if you sign up, you'll have a way to connect throughout the month to other educators setting goals around these practices. You know, we're talking personal life, we're talking shop, all around a regenerative mindset. So you might be saying, all right, this kind of sounds like a, some sort of package deal, Sarah. What are you talking about? Well, I'm sort of in a soft way introducing the project that I've been talking about for a couple months now. It's called We Are Verbs, and it's a space for educators who are really wanting to use their imagination to reimagine the way that we do education and who want to zoom out, 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 and ask really great questions about our lives and our teaching and our systems, and then zoom back in and see how we can put them into practice. And it is for all educators. So if you work with students daily, it's for you. <laughs> I'll have Jess on sometime soon. I think maybe after this podcast, we'll inter- you know interrupt the patterns sequencing a little bit just to talk about we are verbs and to officially give it, I guess we could say, you know, if this is a soft opening, some sort of hard opening maybe. In the meanwhile, you can find out a lot more information at groundandteaching.com backslash we are verbs, or you can click the link below in the bio. I love how the website is laid out. I think it's really helpful. So let me know what you think about that. Um, Shoot me any questions that you may have about it too. And, you know, we can address all of those. We are really, really excited to be committing to programming that we feel is actually invigorating. Um, actually supportive and also affordable. So, um, oh, and one more quick thing on the note of affordability to say thank you for listening to this show. You can sign up for only a dollar for everything that I mentioned above. Okay, only a dollar. I know it's less than the tip that you gave your barista this morning. So why a dollar though? (laughs) Why not just free? Well, we want you to have a little bit of skin in the game, but also so it feels risk-free enough to try it. And I'm really, really confident that if you like this podcast or if you've liked our workshops, you are really going to like this. Um, The code for the $1 membership is podcast monthly, all one word. And you can read more about it on our website or the link in bio. You know, we'll say like, hey, your monthly subscription is almost up. Do you want to keep it? We're not trying to snag anybody to stay if they don't think it's helpful. Um, But we just want you to get in there and try it out. So contact us with any questions that you might have. See if it's the right fit for you. Um, And because of that, I'm really excited because what could be more perfect to talk about today than nuts? I mean, you might be saying, 
what? <laughs> how does that, how, how's that even a segue, Sarah, going from talking about a new grounded teaching program to nuts? You're going to find out, out, out right now. Out, out. See you in a bit. Episode 40. Hey, everyone. We're over the hill, folks. Episode 40. And not only that, it is our seventh pattern that we've explored here in this workshop as a podcast free series. Seven. We've already covered spirals, waves, branches, streamlines, cloud forms, lobes, and now nuts. I'm going to say that, you know, all of them are my favorite in some way, shape, or form, but I actually think that nuts really is one of my favorites. Okay, I'll say it. I think it's the one that I think about the most, and I'm really excited to dig into it with you today. So you know the drill. The first measure for me, um, for if I think about if this podcast is actually being successful, is if you are just noticing patterns in our world with more relationship to them, more respect for them, appreciating more of the beauty in them. If the only thing that happens from this podcast is that you see a net or a web and you are reminded to take an extra 15 seconds out of your day to look at it and let it stir something in you, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. Let's not put so much pressure on ourselves to do, 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 do. Doing is great, but also just being with that web. So your challenge this week is to open up your eyes, to be aware to nets or webs, and then make this a practice of opening up your awareness a smidge, just like we've talked about in the in the previous episodes here. That's where the real work happens. Just noticing that beauty, I'm confident, has a shift in the trajectory of what we're all trying to do here. That's the real work. Okay, so bearing that in mind, we're going to now think about where we see nets. Where do we recall seeing net patterns? Pause the podcast for a moment and then let me know, where do you recall seeing net patterns? The most obvious one, you know, is the spider web. But if you start thinking about one of the obvious functions of a net, you might also think, oh, are my nose hairs like a net, right? They, they catch things. I came across another one, which is really cool, watching a Netflix documentary with my son about sea life, which is the parrotfish. And the parrotfish itself is not a net, but what it does is it secretes a mucus net around herself every night so that she doesn't send her scent out into the ocean so that other predatory fish cannot smell her. So while she's sleeping, she is protected. So we can think here that a net offers protection, right? So pretty simply, if we look at why a spider uses a web. Webs catch food. We think of it as a spider's home. And in some cases, the spider will hang out there. But in a lot of cases, spiders sleep in more protective crack, a corner, a hole somewhere. The nets are a way to catch the nourishment. Okay, so now let's go back to the parrotfish. Does the parrotfish create a net net around her to catch some energy or some nourishment? No. She does it so that she can get some sleep, okay? It's protective. It blocks something that she doesn't want, the smell getting out, right? That's a barrier. That's a boundary. That exists as protection. So we've got nourishment and we've got protection so far that we can observe from these webs. But before we talk about application, I want to give you a third use for a nut. So last year, I was harvesting algae from a pond near our house to put in our garden. And this sounds a lot more technical than it actually was. <laughs> it was... Simply me on a stand-up paddleboard with one of those blue pool nets, because that's what I had around, pulling algae out of the water and then plopping it on the front of the board. So anyways, it was the first time that I'd ever done that, and I was noticing all sorts of things about algae that I didn't really notice before. And I noticed this one type of algae that was shaped like a net. And as I was writing this podcast and thinking about net shapes, I recalled that algae, and I looked it up, and it's actually called um, hydrodictyon. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Hydro is water. Dictyon is net. So water, net. And of course, I'm not an algae expert. If you know about algae, I'd love to talk to you about it because it fascinates me. I have a lot of questions. But there are a few things that I found out about hydrodictyon as I looked into it that I thought would be really helpful for our conversation here. I found out that hydrodictyon do not have a protective something called resistant alginins that other algaes that are closely related to hydrodictyon actually have. Resistant algaeans work to protect the algae through some mechanism in the cell walls, okay? So hydrodictyon, they don't have them. 
But instead, since they don't have that protection, hydrodictyon cells have the ability to reproduce rapidly, due in part to their net-like shape, which allows for a really quick distribution of energy. They don't just have to expand in one direction. They can expand in all different sorts of directions. They create this net-like shape. So what are we actually doing here in this podcast? Well, we're looking at patterns today, nets, that have evolved over a long span of time. We're using those to see if we can replace patterns in our modern industrial world with any of these patterns. Now, why would we do that? Well, we've been talking about it for eight episodes now, and actually it's what we talk about mostly on this podcast. This podcast is a response to that. But if you're just joining us, we do that because most of us live in a modern Western culture that's kind of numbed out and follows all the characteristics of a machine. So hard lines, no nuance, reductionist approaches, bottom line profitability, et cetera, et cetera, all those extractive things. The school system is pretty much created on those principles, as is the rest of the world, which means that like even if you're not in a school system, let's say that you're homeschooling your kids or you're in a private school or something that's a little bit different, um, it may still exist that you are sort of um, doing education as if it were a linear industrial mechanical uh, practice, as opposed to something that mimics more of a living system. Because really, um, mechanical models of thinking are so ubiquitous. So what are we doing? We are looking at other models. Luckily, if we're more aware of the world that we exist in, we can find plenty of them. The pattern in the shape of nets in our world is one of the many patterns or elements or principles that the living world is teaching us about. So let's recap the three purposes of nets that we're going to talk about today. It's an incomplete list, okay? but there are three that we're going into. Protection. So we're thinking about the parrotfish. Uh, Catching nourishment. We're thinking about the spider web. And more of a a lateral and multi-regional expansion as in the hydrodictyon. So up first, we've got protection. The question we might ask to see where this applies is, where do I feel unprotected? Now, this could be a question that you meditate on for a month, but let's just scratch the surface here. The parrotfish uses a net of mucus around herself while she's sleeping because she knows herself well enough to understand that she's vulnerable at that time. (laughs) So... The first question is, where do I know that I'm vulnerable? And the second question is, am I putting up a wall or am I putting up a net? So let's take an example from school. Let's say I've listened to enough Brene Brown and I've heard that vulnerability is a good thing and I'm trying to be more vulnerable with my students. So I'm doing things like apologizing when I lost a student assignment or forgot to grade it. Or let's say I forget to respond to a parent email and I'm I'm you know, I'm, I'm apologizing for that because um, I'm learning and I'm doing that instead of getting defensive and denying, right? All steps in a wonderful direction. This is definitely going to pay off. But then let's say we experience something that we may classify as uh, the vulnerability backfiring <laughs> because for whatever reason, let's say that we apologize to a parent, then the parent may go to the principal and claim that, you know, we're hard to get a hold of. And in that instance, I may feel like my vulnerability backfired. I should have just uh, denied or ignored or something like that, right? Well, how could I respond to this? Well, a mechanical system would give you a hard and fast rule here, like I'm no longer apologizing to parents. That's the boundary that I'm setting up, right? Because that backfired. And that hard and fast boundary is more like a concrete wall, right? Wouldn't you say? Then a... Uh, say, mucousy parrotfish net of protection. (laughs) The net protects us, but it doesn't totally close us off, right? So what we're talking about here, really, when we're thinking about protection is boundaries and nets and the importance of having a boundary that is a little bit flexible. We don't have to build, nor should we, unless there are extreme circumstances, a concrete wall. Okay, the world is made out of boundaries, mainly, that are at least slightly permeable. And maybe the only thing that passes through that mucus is water, but it can still pass through. Okay, in the case of a parent email, instead of saying, I'm not going to apologize to parents ever again, that was a mistake, right? Say to yourself, did I share too much information with the apology? Right, maybe that was the boundary that I crossed. Maybe I keep my apologies short and sweet. Or maybe the apology was short and sweet and worded perfectly after I go back and look at it. And the problem was actually the embarrassment that I had from my principal coming to me. And maybe that's the part where I put up the boundary, which is simply this. I'm not going to let untruths permeate me. 
I have a mucosal net of protection around me, okay? And the only thing that I'm letting in is the truth. Just tell your principal that. They'll totally get it. <laughs> but then when you say that, what you really need to know is the truth about yourself, right? The truth that you are actually not negligent. The truth that this was maybe a one-time thing or was something that was a little bit out of your control or whatever, but, but you are taking responsibility, but that doesn't make you a negligent person, right? That doesn't affect the holistic identity or the whole identity of yourself, right? That's the truth. So you're only letting truth in. That's the boundary, okay? And to do that, you have to do some work about who you are and, and what you know about yourself and what you know to be true. So in short, there are actually, you know, a million ways to look at vulnerability and boundaries and protection and volumes and volumes are written on it. Folks are experts in it. I'm not an expert in boundaries, but what I am pretty good at is not complicating it, not complicating things. So if we can try to function less like a concrete wall in our boundaries and more like a permeable net, and why do I know that this is a good thing to do? I know this is a good thing to do. I know this is something that I can trust because I see this pattern play out in thriving ecosystems all the time. So if I have varying degrees of permeation with my boundaries that I'll need to figure out through some trial and error probably, that's what is important here. And one more quick note about the parrotfish before I move on to catching nourishment. Could the parrotfish swim all day around with a mucus bubble around her, so not just at night? Sure. Would she be more protected from predators during the day? Sure. So we're talking about never getting rid of the boundaries, right? Why doesn't she do this? Well, because predators can use other senses during the day like sight to find her. So it might, it's going to lose a little bit of its effectiveness. But also, like, how would you eat? if you were consistently covered in a bubble of mucus, right? Wouldn't your waist get trapped up in your bubble? Okay, there's a reason why she only uses it at night, and I'm no marine biologist, and so I don't know the exact reasons why, but I'm sure it has to do something with risk versus reward here. So when you put up the protection, you know that it might not be worth having in perpetuity, or at least it's worth reassessing at times, like, is my shit building up in my own protective bubble? <laughs> I love this metaphor of the parrotfish because literally its shit would start building up in its own mucus bubble if it used it all the time. And I mean, yeah, that, that could happen to us, right? That's the trade-off. I could do a whole other episode, and maybe I should, on what this mucosal nut can teach us about the parrotfish, about risk and reward and taking risks. But let's just kind of let that example simmer in us a little bit about when we're putting up boundaries, where we're putting up boundaries, how permeable they should be. And really what it comes down to is, is a lot of trial and error and risk versus reward. Okay, so that's the protection piece, and it's really just scratching the surface, I know. But let's move into our section, second function here, which is catching nourishment. The best place to see where it, if it makes sense to apply a net is to ask yourself, what parts of my life, my day, my work, whatever, are draining? Is my net too wide? Is the type of nourishment that I'm looking for too small? Do I even have a net out, <laughs> right? Meaning like, am I even able to catch the good things that come my way because I'm aware enough? You, you might be saying I'm burnt out at X, Y, or Z, as most educators are at some point. And I'm, I'll even argue that most professionals in general are at some point because we all exist in a grind culture, industrial paradigm. So the question is, do I even have a net out there to catch nourishing things? Is my net broken? Is my net too wide? Does it have too big of holes in it? Is it way too small and not letting some of the bad stuff pass through? And is the net getting so clogged that it's not really filtering things out anymore and I can't you know, sort out the good from the bad? Awareness is how we cast our net. Awareness of how perfectly fluffy your dog is. Awareness of how the breeze feels. Awareness of the way it feels when you see a text from your friend. Is your net catching those things? Is your net, you know, is it even out? Awareness of student growth. Awareness of student joy. Awareness of how actually good you are at your job. Awareness of the capability of your body. You know, we're going to have a guest um, on this podcast in a few weeks that, who can talk more to us about creating awareness and some other really good stuff. If we want to feel nourished, we've got to cast a net that is going to catch that nourishment. Okay, so that's a part of a net. That's part of a function of a net is catching that nourishment. All right, so now we've got two functions. We've got protection we've got harvesting nourishment. And the last function we're going to go into today, today is equal efficient distribution of energy and expansion, which we learn about from the hydrodictyon. So partly because of that net-like shape and its ability to distribute energy and expand in all different directions, it really can grow rapidly and cover a wide base pretty quickly. And it seems that if you don't have a protective net on the outside, 
you know, if we're thinking about the parrotfish with that protective net, you could actually be a protective net and survive because of your shape, which I thought was really interesting. So nets here really offer a lot of protection. A quick reminder that this pattern, just like all patterns, shouldn't be applied to everything because all things have a different purpose. So for example, my body is not shaped like a net. Okay, for a human being, the most efficient distribution of energy is not actually equal, right? It doesn't make sense. Uh, it mainly goes to my brain, my energy. That's where most of my energy in terms of just, you know, location is distributed uh, because it's so important to a human uh, to have a high level functioning brain. There are a lot of things that aren't shaped like nets. Okay, there are a lot of things that prioritize energy in other ways. But what we're asking here is is there a place where I'm not able to grow because I'm thinking too linearly instead of branching out in all directions? So if you think about other algae compared to the hydrodictyon under a microscope, some of them grow, um, some of them look like a big, long green oval, or they're, they sort of look like a piece of bamboo underneath a microscope, but mainly they grow into a shape, like a more linear, longer shape, right? And there's a linear limit to it because of that shape. But with a net, there's expansion in all ways, which makes it able to cover more area quickly. And I think the question here is, where are we feeling a dead end, right? And instead of trying to push our energy through the dead end, instead we could be expanding to the right or to the left or even to the back. And so here's an example. Let's say that you're working on teaching your students a specific concept and you give them an assignment. And let's say you review their work and they all did really poorly. Do you just reteach the same concept again and then tell them to redo the assignment? You probably don't because you're listening to this podcast, but I remember when I was a first year teacher who was teaching writing, I wasn't actually teaching writing. I was assigning writing and I was grading writing, but I wasn't teaching writing in a way that if my students did poorly on the previous uh, assignment, I would teach them how to do it differently so that they would do better. And somehow I just hoped that they would just magically get better as I repeated the same writing lesson each time. And this is the same thing as trying to use our energy to expand forwards. But what we need to do is expand out like a net. Try it from this angle. Try it from this angle. Back up a bit. Look at it from over here. And so we've actually created this web because we've been touching all these different points, this web of understanding that is strong enough to hold an idea. And this is part of the problem of feeling like we're in a system that only values that linear. We end up hitting more dead ends than possible, but we feel like the only way to grow and distribute our energy is forward. And if we can learn from the hydrodictium, we can learn that expanding out connected by a net might actually be the best way to hold the information that we want to hold. And, you know, this gets away from the hydrodictium a bit, but I do want to share that I used to play this cheesy game with my students where you all stand in a circle and then you toss the yarn ball from point to point and, you know, the student holds on to one part of the yarn and then they toss the ball again. Maybe you've played it, um, but they'll share information about a topic, something that they read or whatever, um, or get, they'll give their opinion on something and it starts to create a web. And it looks sort of cheesy, but it's really effective because after enough people share their understanding back and forth, you can start to visually see that the web of knowledge in this case is really strong. And if you skip a couple students, there's going to be some holes in your web, right? Some really weak areas. So we want to be sure that everybody's included. Everybody's perspective is included. And when it gets stronger, it has more resilience. You could actually place something on top of the web, right? We could put our like textbooks on it or something. And then pretty soon it looks more like a solid thing than actually a web. And that's when your understanding of a subject is really res It would take a lot to break it. But you see all that knowledge has to come from different angles. Even if you just went back and forth between two people with the string and have them share their understanding back and forth like a debate, right? So we get two different perspectives and maybe even very different perspectives. It would still feel very linear. It wouldn't look like a web. It wouldn't be as strong. If you place something on top and you're picturing sort of that string going back and forth, it could slip through, right? If you introduced a third person, so you have sort of this triangle, you know, these three points patterns, it would get better. But the more perspectives that you introduce, the stronger the web is going to be. So this is the point of diversity. We see time and time again in the living world that diversity creates strength. That is why we do DEI work, not so we can check something off of a box. If you do DEI work or any kind of work with, uh, you know, uh, even with a good intention, but you do it within a compliance paradigm, it's not going to be as effective as you hope. It's just not. We have to shift the underlying paradigm, the underlying understanding of why this stuff is important. And that's why 
I point to living systems because the proof is in the pudding (laughs) and the proof is right there. Anybody can observe it. So anyways, that's what we're trying to do here. And, you know, today we use nuts as one super specific entry point to help us get a little closer to that. And that's it. If you enjoyed this podcast today, share it with someone and then check out We Are Verbs on the website. The link is in the show notes or it's just grounded teaching backslash We Are Verbs. Up next, we have our final podcast about patterns in this pattern series, which is the scatter pattern, scatter pattern, scatter pattern. (laughs) Love how that sounds together. But before I do that, I might actually record a quick talk with Jess, a twin talk, to properly introduce and then answer some questions about we are verbs. In the meanwhile, may you feel protected through your flexible boundaries, may your improved awareness harvest nourishment, and may you consider all the possibilities for broadening out instead of bulldozing forward. Much love to all of you.